And I watched how other artists use it that I was on this show with, people that lead with it, people that never talk about it, people that act like it never happened. I would put it on a business card. Yeah, see, <laughs> see? <laughs> Lauren from The Voice. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. Like, do I use it as leverage or do I use it as something, as a stepping stone? Mm-hmm. Right. So it has definitely helped me secure lots of gigs mm-hmm. just because of the status. Yeah. But I'm constantly trying to work past it mm-hmm. so that people are not just seeing me as a gimmick. Yeah. You're listening to For the Record, a conversation about music, mixing, and the creative industry. Our guest today is Lauren Hall. Lauren is a 27-year-old singer-songwriter out of Chicago. She was also featured as a contestant on season 17 of The Voice. Uh, Lauren, hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I am good. How are you? I'm so good. Um, yeah, so let's just get started. I mean, we know each other somewhat well. Yeah. Um, not incredibly so, but I've known you for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we've talked a bit about your story, but I'd love to hear just a little bit about uh, who you are, the things that you enjoy, and then I'll love to hear some of like your background and how you got to where you are. Sure. And where am I? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Caffeinated records. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm Lauren, as we all know this. Um, I'm 27. I'm originally from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, I grew up around here, but I also just spent the last four years living in Los Angeles. Mm. So there's a lot of in between in there. Um, as long as I could remember, I was a soccer player mm-hmm. and also a singer. Okay. So a lot of my focus was on soccer growing up. Um, I don't know, my family just, I, I swear, like the, the first thing in my hands as a child was a soccer ball <laughs> or feet, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I guess. So what the whole goal was growing up was really to get a soccer scholarship to go to school and, you know, mm-hmm. get my school paid for. And after that, you do what you do. Yeah. So I had to put a lot of focus and time into soccer growing up. I played for some really competitive teams um, growing up from like 12 to 20 years old. My whole life was pretty much soccer. It was Mm. practice after school every day. It was we were in other states every weekend playing tournaments. Yeah. And, you know, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the camaraderie of being on a team. And those were all of my friends growing up. But a lot of my experiences were kind of revolved around soccer. You were like all in. Literally all in, <laughs> all in, which was fine for a bit. And then when I turned about, I can't remember the specific time mm-hmm. that I realized that I could sing, but at some point I realized that I could sing. Right. And I was like, oh, I think I'm actually kind of better than the average person. <laughs> oh, that's a fun realization. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I think it was when we got the karaoke machine in the nineties, you know, that Christmas where everybody got a karaoke machine. I was probably not born yet. <laughs> wow. But I mean, hey. <laughs> but way, Ben probably remembers. <laughs> way to age me. Ben, do you I remember? remember? I remember. Okay, oh, cool. Oh my goodness. I think I got one too. There was also a year <laughs> where we only got Razor scooters. Did you guys get that? I Okay, the, the neighbors did, and they had several. You were the I did cool that kid. <laughs> no. You had to go next door to steal oh, their scooters. We, <laughs> we did. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Fair right. enough. Um, but nonetheless, around like 12, 13 years old, I joined the first, or I auditioned for my first musical in middle school. Mm -hmm. And that's, I had terrible stage fright, like terrible. I remember my audition, I sang The Little Mermaid, Part of Your World, and my eyes were shut the whole time. Um, but I made it into the musical and after I had my first opening night, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It was just this wow. like moment where like I was on stage and I don't know, I think you're just born with that. I think people that are meant to be on stage are born with that feeling of like nothing will compare to when I am on stage and I am performing. Mm-hmm. And I guess I was born with that. So after about 13 is when I started to really like start to understand and explore my voice a little bit. Now, I started to 
build a little bit of resentment towards soccer because soccer monopolized all of my time. Right. It was like you had two things like vying for your affection. Exactly. So, yeah. and especially with sports and music, they're so time consuming, both of them. Mm -hmm. And they expect all of your attention. Yeah. Because not a lot of people do both mm -hmm. or are interested in both. Some people are just sports minded and then there's the artists. Right. For some reason, I had both. Um, you just can do all the things. I guess so. Just so talented. <laughs> Um, but to be honest with you, soccer never really came easy to me. So it was also hard mentally to be juggling the two because music, I was like, this is natural and this is something that I really enjoy. And soccer was like, this is really hard and it's not that fun anymore. But mm. I stuck with it. Um, but they were always constantly going, battling against each other. I, I didn't have the time to be pursuing anything musical yeah. at all, really. Um, and... Any time that I tried, it blew up in my face. Mm. <laughs> so, what do you mean? Like, how did it? How did it blow up? Well, I remember specifically when I was about, I think I was sixteen or seventeen, and I went to Stevenson High School, which mm -hmm. had an incredible theater and music program, like all of the resources you could ever ask for at a school. It was at Stevenson High School. Okay. Um, and I wanted to join a musical. It was Sweeney Todd. It was my favorite musical. Yeah. It's a very gory musical. Have you seen Sweeney Todd? I haven't, no, but I know I know some things about it. Yeah. Yeah, there's some things. <laughs> <laughs> but um I I auditioned for it and I remember just being very like hesitant about it and telling the musical director, you know, like I am also an athlete and I will probably have some issues with some of the rehearsals, but I will give you all that I can. And mm -hmm. I'm serious. I'm serious about this. Yeah. Um, and I ended up getting a part in the musical and I, I remember emailing her and I was like, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this team. Mm -hmm. Just to remind you, these are the days I'm going to have conflicts with it because of soccer. And I remember it so vividly. She called me on the phone and she was like, you know, I didn't realize that there were going to be this many issues and I really can't have someone on the cast that isn't fully committed mm. and basically kicked me, kicked me out of the musical. So there was like a real specific, tangible, like conflict between these two, not yes. just like an internal, yes. which one do I want to do? It was like yeah. costing you something. Yeah. And I remember being, I just remember... I lost it. Like I was just, cause I had been dealing with it for so many years with like my coach giving me grief for like wanting to do other things on the side. Yeah. And it was finally like I had made this musical that I was just, I wanted to be in it so bad. Mm -hmm. And I was so sure that I could juggle the two and for someone to not even give me the chance to try to juggle the two, it, yeah. I just lost it. And it was from then on that I just stopped trying to do both mm. when I, it was like, I think it was my junior year of high school. Looking back, do you feel like that was like a good decision? Like, do you regret that? <sighs> I live, I live with no regrets. I okay. fully believe that every single thing that has happened to me has led me to where I am today. Even the mm -hmm. horrible, horrible things that felt terrible in the moment. Yeah. So I don't regret it because I think I would have received a lot of backlash from my soccer coach. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Because eventually, with all the time and commitment that I put into soccer, I ended up getting a soccer scholarship to a school, to a Division One school, which is not a small feat. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So I, you know, I kind of just accepted the fact that I was going to have to be pursuing music on the side as much as I could, singing on the side. I was taking piano lessons all growing up from five years old to about. 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was still like getting the time to practice, but I never really got to put my full heart into it yeah. on a stage or anything, which kind of stunk because I didn't really get to have the experiences that a lot of young artists got to have when they were younger. Like say Billie Eilish, who right. parents were like at nine years old, go, go <laughs> on stage, create music. So was there a point where there was like a, a turning point and you can think of like, this was like my first gig? You know what I mean? Like I know you did musicals yeah. and things like that. But. Yes. <laughs> so I don't even remember how I got the uh, 
at some point in college. Mm -hmm. So I went to go play at Ball State and I was dabbling in things here and there. I found a practice room. Whenever I would find a piano, I would play it and I would sing. And yeah. it'd be a fun little gimmick. Everybody would be like, oh my God, a soccer player that can sing. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It was just weird to be the singing soccer player. I just wanted to be the singer, you know? Yeah. But anyways, I would come back during the summer to Illinois because, I mean, it, it wasn't that far. It was in Indiana. Ball State's in Indiana. Okay. And... I got connected with, I must have gotten connected with some random Chicago musician. You, you know how you just don't even remember how you meet people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And they put me up at this tiny little, it was like a theater playhouse. It was like an improv theater, like a stage this big, not even exaggerating, mm -hmm. like the smallest stage, like platform. And I just brought my best friend, Larry. And he played guitar, and I just sat in a chair and I sang. Mm -hmm. And I just remember like telling all of my friends and family about it. And yep. they filled the spot. And my family and my friends have been so supportive of even the most random last minute gigs. I'm very lucky. Yeah. Um, but I just remember I sang for probably like one hour or something. And I just remember that being like the scariest, like trying to learn all those songs, remember all those lyrics, like the yeah. stage fright, all of it. Like, what do I wear? Mm -hmm. um, that was my first gig. And it was in Waukegan, I think. It okay. was just the most random spot. <laughs> and it went great. It was actually right before my 21st birthday because I remember I went to go get my first like legal drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so it, my first gig was when I was 21. Yeah. Which is Again, it's like late when I talk to other musicians. I'm like, they've been doing this forever. And I'm like, I feel like I just got a late start. Yeah. Um, but I actually had um, someone pick me up as a manager. He was like, okay, I want to manage you. And I was like, oh, my God, yay, like stars in my eyes. Someone <laughs> wants to be my manager. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's never happened to me. I've never been in your position. But like someone coming up and being like, I want – like, I want you to be on my team. I want to, like, represent you. Like, that's Ironic, cool. by the way. Oh, I yeah? want you. We'll talk about that later. Uh, okay. Right. Um, it's literally exactly what Kelly Clarkson did. It says, I want you when they press the button. No? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no. It's great. <laughs> but, yes, it's like the dream come true. It's mm -hmm. um, You grow up in the Midwest especially, and mm -hmm. you are fed this dream of, okay, so the Midwest is where, in my opinion, all of the media is targeted to because mm -hmm. the Midwest is what's really consuming a lot of the TV and the movies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And you're taught you have your little small town, you sing, you do your thing, some... Hollywood Big Shot's going to walk up to you and see you playing at a coffee house and say, oh, my God, you're amazing. Come to L.A. <laughs> I'll take care of you. I'll put you up in a penthouse suite. We'll hook you up with a label. We'll give you clothes. And Right, like this whole rags to riches story. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how often that's really happened, maybe mm -hmm. back in the day, but... It was like my my moment where I was like, oh my god, like my dream's about to happen. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out the way that I wanted it to. No, <laughs> no, it did not. Um, I was working with this person, and looking back now, um, I think he had good intentions. I just think that we were both struggling musicians, and we wanted sure. to make something of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And he saw someone that was borderline desperate to be seen, mm -hmm. as I think a lot of artists are. Yeah. Because um, we don't know how to do it on our own. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. You're not given a guidebook of how to become a pop star. It's not a thing. <laughs> uh, there is no blueprint. It just every single person has a completely different story. Yeah. You know. Um. We worked together. He did help me get a few gigs. Like I played at the House of Blues in Chicago, which was, oh my gosh, so cool. That is cool. So cool. Um, but 
he wanted to get me into the studio. Okay. And so, again, that's the big thing. Like, you hear buzz phrases and buzz words as a young artist that knows nothing about the music industry. Mm -hmm. I want to get you in the studio. Right. I want to get you to record. Yep. And you're like, okay, I have no idea what that means, but all right. Mm -hmm. Nor do you know how much that takes resources wise. Mm -hmm. So we started an Indiegogo campaign. And um, my friends and family, as I said earlier, are absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And we raised the money that we wanted in probably like a week or less. Dang. It was because people had been waiting and supporting my dream for so long. And they're like, finally, Lauren's singing and she's going to record. Yeah. Again, no one knows what that means. Because <laughs> um, they're all like Midwesterners. They don't know what that means. I mean. Right. And you're like, are you going to be on the radio? Exactly. And yeah. it, it's it's so like obscure, everything that goes on behind the scenes. Um, we raised the money. And my manager, you know, he told me like, okay, we're going to go in the studio and we're going to do this. And I was like, okay, cool. And a lot of things went wayward and it it just happened that he mismanaged the funds mm. that we raised. Mm -hmm. um, mistakes were made on my part, trusting someone else with the money that my friends and family gave me, which I will not be making that mistake again. Yeah. Everything's a learning experience. Um, but yeah, pretty much all of the money that was raised through the campaign was drained through by my manager with things that I was not consulted on mm. and I didn't really get to get in the studio, which was, which was like the whole thing, the entire, yeah, yeah, it was the whole goal and it was really disheartening. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Because I felt very taken advantage of. And not only me, like you can. <sighs> my tolerance for these things, things that are going wrong, things that go wrong is very high. I've been through a lot. Yeah. Um, But it hurt the most that I felt like I was letting my friends and family down. Mm -hmm. And it just it was it was just frustrating. Yeah. It was very frustrating and I had to take the losses and I knew that this is actually the first time I've actually come out and told this story. Wow. Yeah. Exclusive content. Yes. Because I was embarrassed. Yeah. You know, like thinking back, I'm like, I don't know why I would have allowed someone else to control the funds that I raised with my friends and family. But again, I learned from it. Yeah. Well, um, it's it's tough, right? Like when you're starting out, I mean, first of all, you don't know what you're doing. No idea. But there's such like an unknown world of like, I want to do all these things and it just feels inaccessible. And if yep. all of a sudden you're like, you can reach it, you're going to like grasp it and yeah. you're going to run fully at it and you're going to miss some stuff. Like I, I think a lot of people have either that story or they're at least in this posture of saying like, if only I had that moment, like that's the thing that's holding me back. And so, I mean, I think hearing a story like that is actually a really wise cautionary oh, tale yeah. to like, um, you know, don't just jump at the first opportunity to, to still have discernment and, um, and be wise. I think that's really wise. Yeah. You know, it's hard because people tend to really take advantage of artists, young artists and people who have dreams because mm -hmm. yes, you don't want to jump at the first opportunity, but you're like, is there going to be a, another opportunity? Right. I have no idea how to, is this a once in a lifetime opportunity? It's again, mm -hmm. like, it's like that dream of like someone finds you on the street and picks you up and takes care of you. And it was all meant to be, but you do have to be really careful. It's, and everybody, nobody around me knew this was going to happen either. So uh, we were all very new to it. Yeah. So again, it, it, it taught me to be very careful about the people that I allow into my circle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It definitely prepared me for a place like Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that process. Like what got you from this kind of area to LA? Sure. So it kind of starts with college. During my college years, I knew I, I wasn't even going to try mm -hmm. to balance college athletics 
with trying to pursue music. Yeah. Because I knew that my music goals were lofty. My sure. my my music goals have never been I wanna release a few songs and play a few gigs. It's always been literally I wanna be the next Adele. That's <laughs> been it. <laughs> I think a lot of people have been in, in your shoes. Yeah. And, and are. And it seems ridiculous, but I don't know. It's for some reason in my heart, I, I truly believe I could achieve it. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But when I was when I was in college, I would sing like the national anthem for games here and there and dabble song right in between classes. But I think when I was when I was about eighteen, I started auditioning for The Voice, mm-hmm. and. The Midwest dream is you audition for a reality TV show. Mm -hmm. You get on the show. Yeah. You make it. Mm -hmm. And the rest is history. Like, Yeah, this this is actually perfect timing because I was going to ask you like where the voice kind of fit in this process. This, I had a few, I I had a lot of thoughts on how I was going to wiggle my way in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was the voice. I did audition for American Idol when I was 15. It did not go well. No? Well... You not tried, a great, though. not a great experience. I mean, even if it went bad, not many fifteen-year-olds could be like, "I auditioned for American Idol." That is true. I definitely had cojones mm-hmm. from a young age. Yeah. Um, but when I started auditioning for The Voice, it was like my way to be like, "Okay, there's this huge audition, and if I make it, everything else will take care of itself." Mm-hmm. So when I was eighteen, I started, and literally from age. 18 to 25, I auditioned for The Voice. Wow. So I auditioned seven times for The Voice to the point where I was in Indiana at Ball State. I would leave after practice and drive four and a half hours to Chicago to audition. Mm-hmm. I got a call back. I drove back to Indiana. The call back was three days later. I drove back to Illinois four and a half hours, did the call back. Drove back to Indiana four and a half hours and then was at practice the next morning. That is like, that's next level commitment. (laughs) Like how, that's not a quick drive. No. And it's cornfields. Mm. Yeah. Scenic. (laughs) Right? The Midwest. But just like, I can't even tell you when there is something that I truly want. And for me, it is the voice or it was singing. Um, I just have laser focus Mm -hmm. so i i I don't care how much i have to drive i'll do it yeah any day i think there's something unique and special about that i hope everyone finds something that they feel like that about yeah Yeah. you know Mm -hmm. i want to say that this studio is probably that for you yeah that's that yeah 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 like this i feel like this was made like yeah, truthfully, uh, this studio has been, it's a crazy process. And that's definitely a story for another time. But it's been, I mean, I definitely feel that like almost stars in my eyes, like sitting in this yes. space being like, this was, my, this was my dream and it's happening. It's kind of insane, it's, right? It's like a bit surreal, yeah. It's like nothing can stop you. You're just in it. Mm-hmm. And you're passionate about it. Yeah. And you can tell by the way that it's come together. It's really, really amazing, honestly. Oh. Well, thank you. But but, uh, but enough about me. I've stopped. We're talking about you. Yes, yes. So I, I'm going to get a little technical with sure. NCAA rules here. Okay. Okay. So I may have left out a small detail in my college career. Mm-hmm. At first, I went to University of Arkansas. I redshirted my first year at Arkansas, mm-hmm. which means that I did not play a minute on the field. Okay. I thought about quitting. And pursuing music. Yeah. But then I thought, oh, no. I did not skip homecoming, turnabout, dances, weekends with my friends in high school so that I can give up after my first year. Mm -hmm. So I found myself a new school. And I went to Ball State. And I played three fall seasons Mm -hmm. um, at Ball State. So if you get a red shirt... That means that you have one more season to play. So I thought about possibly staying at Ball State. Yeah. But then I thought about spending another year in Indiana, and I was like, better not. (laughs) (laughs) But then I started thinking, hmm, if a Division I team wants me to stay for another year, 
maybe a Division II team would be interested in me. Mm. So I started doing my research. Yeah. And lo and behold, all of the CCAA schools in California are all Division II. Okay. So I started emailing schools. I started going on visits, and mm-hmm. I was like, this is my ticket. This is my ticket to California. Mm-hmm. I had to start my master's. I mean, I could get through a master's if that meant that I was moving to California. Right. So I sold it to my mom, and I said, hey, if I go get my master's, I can just spend two years in California, mm-hmm. get it out of my system, and then come running back to you in Illinois. Sure. So... I went on a few visits, um, and this is where my mind really started to shift as far as what my first priority was, Mm because I made a promise to myself. Yeah. Once I'm done with school, once I'm done with college soccer, music is going to be my focus. I owe that to myself. Yeah. So I went on a few visits to some schools all over the coast, Mm -hmm. um, and I had some schools in the conference that were top of the conference, bottom of the conference, and middle of the conference. Okay. I could have easily gone to the top of the conference team, and I thought about it. Mm -hmm. But the top conference team was in the middle of nowhere. It was basically the Muncie, Indiana of California. (laughs) Yeah. And then there was the school, another school that was the bottom of the conference, but it was right in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Okay. So I was like, okay, Lauren, you really need to think about this. What is your first priority? Mm-hmm. Do you want to play one more season and play for a great team and maybe win the conference and then be working at an in and out in that city for the last two years? <laughs> right. Or do you want to play for the bottom of the conference team, maybe make a difference, maybe help them out a little bit, and then once you're done, you'll be right where you want to be? Mm. I'm guessing that's the one you did. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. I did. I picked the one closer to LA. Mm-hmm. It was a very fun season. I got to be a captain and I led the team and we did really well, but we didn't win. Right. But at the end of the day, the resources and where I was at, I had fun with soccer that year. Yeah. And it was kind of like a farewell. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just hit the ground running with music. Okay. So... In between all that time, I kept auditioning for The Voice. Um, I met a few people. I had some great collaborative experiences with other artists Uh of asking me to come in the studio and sing on their songs, Mm -hmm. all ranging from all levels of music. Sure. Yes. That's that's a... That's like a fun experience though. I feel like oh, yes. it's it's like the little things to be like, oh, there's this little like R and B song I did some vocals on. Yes, no big deal. Exactly. And it's fun and it's good experience. You're mm-hmm. as long as I'm in front of a mic, I'm having a good time yeah. at the end of the day. So um another reason why I wanted to move to Los Angeles is because I low key had the thought process. I knew that the voice filmed in LA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep, yep. I knew that it cost them money to send artists from other areas to L.A. Right. So you're incentivizing yourself. So I was basically saying, you know, it's not that much money for them to take me in and give me a shot. I'm close by. They could just give me a call and I'll be there in a second. Mm -hmm. So maybe this will up my chances to being on The Voice. Isn't that funny how the brain works? Like the number of times that like I can think of several specific times that I'm like, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. But like also, (laughs) if this was to happen, I wouldn't hate that. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And it's like I it all worked out the way it should have for Mm -hmm. sure. Um. I put myself, what I was doing was putting myself in the perfect situation to make my dreams come true. At least what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which at that time, I think it was the perfect place to be. Yeah. So so a time came Mm -hmm. where you actually made it. Yes. On The Voice. Yes. So like, I have my own envisions of what that looks like. And I think a lot of people do. Of course. Um, I mean, just the idea of like being on like a reality TV show, being like facing celebrities. And like, yeah. if you guys haven't seen it, like, um, was it your first like big 
My blind audition? Mm-hmm. Like, how many, like, seconds into you singing did Kelly Clarkson, like, boom? You've been on my mind. Five, five notes. Yeah. Five yeah. Notes. Like, that is a cool moment. Yeah. And so just tell me about, like, the process of that experience. Yeah. So once I finally got chosen to be on the show, you get put up in a hotel mm-hmm. with a lot of artists. Okay. And... You're there for a month. Mm-hmm. And when you say a lot of artists, like ballpark, what were we talking? About 100. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And if you really do the math here, each coach has 12 people that they choose for their team. Mm-hmm. So 12 times 4 is what, 48? Yep. Yeah. So throughout that month, you are going through a training process, mm-hmm. um, which includes wardrobe, makeup, mm-hmm. Song selection, okay. band rehearsals, choreography, voice lessons. Did I already say that? I don't think so. You <laughs> might have. <laughs> um, dress rehearsals, whatever. All of that. Okay. Um, which, from what I've understood from other uh, competition shows, like reality shows, mm-hmm. that is the most training that you'll get from any other show. Wow. Um, they really cared about the artist development, mm-hmm. which I was super surprised because... Yeah. Hollywood is Hollywood, mm-hmm. you know? It's funny because at the same time, and this may just be me, but like internally, I'm picturing like the Hunger Games. <laughs> I just watched that the other day and I actually likened it to the experience. But yeah. it's interesting because it's interesting you say that because mm-hmm. the whole ally situation yeah, of like you all know that you're in this at the end, you guys are, there's going to be one, mm-hmm. but you can't get through it alone and without the help of others. Yeah. So a lot of the artists, you band together. Mm -hmm. And in that first round, it's competitive, but it's not that competitive because you're all just trying to get on the show at this point, you know? And we all just got along. You're all coming from all over the country, Mm -hmm. um, all different walks of life, all different ages, um, every situation you could think of. And you make really good friends. Mm-hmm. And that was my, in my opinion, that was my favorite part of the show. Yeah. The different people I got to meet. I mean, I'm, they're lifelong friends, some of the people that I met on the show. That's cool. And genuine lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, there are people that their focus was solely on the show and they didn't want to really fraternize with their enemies. Right. And there's people that only fraternized with the enemies and weren't focused on what they were supposed to be doing. <laughs> They're just like, oh my gosh, I'm at the, I'm exactly. at the voice. This is crazy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, I definitely think my soccer career, when I say like no regrets, like the time and commitment that I had to put into soccer, mm-hmm. the laser focus, the being coached, yeah, um, preparing for a big game, mm-hmm. that's exactly the mindset I went into for the blind audition. Okay. So... Um, After all of the band rehearsals and the voice rehearsals that you spend a month on to sing a minute and a half of a song, they can only prepare you so much until that day of where they're filming you Mm -hmm. backstage. You have a mic in your hand and you're pacing back and forth in front of those red doors. Yeah. Waiting for them to open it for you. Yeah. There's kind of this like, holy crap, I'm here moment. Yeah. And the producers, they could do everything to prepare Mm -hmm. you. But if you can't handle that moment, that's you. Yeah. I know people are like, this is staged, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, but no one, you can't fake what happens when you walk onto that stage. You just yeah. can't. Yeah. So the moment of, I'm like getting, <laughs> my heart is racing <laughs> thinking about it, of hearing over the loudspeaker, like next artist is coming through, audience or silence in the audience, or whatever the heck they say. I don't know. Yeah, You would probably know better, Ben, what do producers say when they're trying to get the audience to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, they did that. It went completely silent, live studio audience. Mm-hmm. And I walked up those steps, prayed to God that I didn't fall. That would have been... <sighs> uh, you would have been a different kind of famous. I would have pulled a Jennifer Lawrence at the Oscars. Ah, uh, yeah. I looked over at the band guy, the the drummer, and he looked at me. He's like, you got this. And I was like, I love you. I looked <laughs> straight ahead. 
my family was right there mm -hmm. when I walked across the stage. And I saw their faces. You look forward, you see the back of the chairs only. Yeah. And at this point, how many celebrities have you seen in person? Right. Let alone your literal idol that you've watched since you were nine years old, Kelly Clarkson. Mm -hmm. Just the back of their chairs. And I'm just praying like, this is my one shot. This is literally the moment that I've been waiting for since I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. To stand on this stage. Yeah. And to sing. I don't even care what happens after this. <laughs> and I just took a big deep breath and I just said you've been on my mind and Kelly turned her chair mm -hmm. and I blacked out the rest of it <laughs> really not even kidding <laughs> that's so funny I'm not even kidding because like in that moment I can imagine if I was in your position like I feel like I would have stopped singing and been like I'm sorry this is amazing. I was so I was very close. I'm gonna be honest with you. They literally told you before you went on stage, you're like, whatever happens, do not stop singing. Mm -hmm. I'm not even kidding. They said that. <laughs> they probably learned the hard oh, way. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So she turned her chair. Mm -hmm. Um, and immediately all like the nerves kind of because you have that like, oh my god, are they gonna like me? Mm -hmm. What if I go through the whole song and no one turns? How embarrassing. Right. And it kind of like the nerves washed out of me and I just performed the crap out of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got really good feedback. Kelly was the only one who turned. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. But it was like five notes in. Yeah. Like for, that's, that's a, that's a big deal. Yes. And that was the really big kicker for me. It was someone that I've looked up to my whole life. Heard just the tone of my voice, not even where I could go with it. Mm -hmm. Just heard the tone of my voice. Yeah. And knew that I was talented. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was the only validation I had really needed my whole life for me to know that this is what I wanted to do my whole life. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. Because mm. the question was always like, am I crazy for thinking that I can do this? Am I crazy yeah. for thinking that I could be the next Adele? Like I, right. you know, like there are people and, you see on these shows and you're like, yeah, well now you have like a professional who's you, you're not paying who like their whole job is to be 100% brutally honest yep. about whether or not you have talent or not yeah yeah and she said yeah <laughs> so i got onto the show the rest of the process was pretty much the same mm -hmm. lots of rehearsals um spending time in between because there were so many artists the schedule like it goes off of there's just a lot of downtime because they can't fit everybody in at one time that you makes know? sense. Yeah. So the battle rounds was super fun. Mm -hmm. Getting to do like a duet. Yes, it's a battle, but it's really a duet. Yeah. And I went against two people, two very talented little girls, mm -hmm. 13 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> I was of like course. blown away. And I had that experience. I wasn't chosen to win. Mm -hmm. And that moment, the, the moment where Kelly chose Hello Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, immediately I was like, okay, this, this sucks. Mm -hmm. And Kelly hugged us and we had a few like very like special moments together during rehearsals where like I just could really, I, I felt very connected to her and maybe everybody thinks that about their coaches, but mm -hmm. she is such an incredible genuine human being i was blown away i did yeah. not expect it because like she's a mega star yeah you know um and i just poured my heart out to her i mean you guys can all watch this on youtube if you'd like i cried a lot <laughs> i was just like <laughs> kelly yeah it was the whole crying on national television thing that i had made fun of people for for a really long time i did it right um and who then, hasn't done that? Yeah, who hasn't <laughs> cried on national television, you know? I mean, honestly. Ben, you've cried on national television? Not yet, but I'm sure I will <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Just stick around me. It'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I walked off stage, and um, right before my foot was off, I'm not even kidding, the only thought when I was walking off was, I'm going to have to go serve tables again. <laughs> that was like my first thought. Mm-hmm. And Blake pushes button, stole me, 
Really? I just stopped in my tracks and started sobbing. Carson <laughs> had to come get me and bring me back onto stage. And I was like, so like, I didn't even know what to say. I was just, thank you. I, you haven't spoken a word to me and you didn't even turn your chair the first time, but thank you. Right. You're like, this is an emotional roller coaster. Yes. It was, the responses were genuine. Let me just tell you when people are like, it's just when your whole life and dream is literally in the hands of one human being, mm -hmm. it is a very emotional process. Yeah. And to know that if one person didn't make this motion, mm -hmm. I was going to have to go back to getting paid minimum wage and cleaning people's tables. That's a big thing. Yeah. You know, it's not a small deal. Mm -hmm. And, um, Got to stick around for one more, one more song. Yeah. Um, got to meet Taylor Swift. That's pretty cool. She was our mega mentor. Oh yeah. Um, she told me I was meant for this stage, which was pretty cool to to hear that from Miss Taylor Swift. Yeah. Mm. No big deal. No big deal. No name dropping here. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, if you're listening. Taylor. <laughs> I have nothing to say. I had nothing to say to her after that. Um, I was Taylor, uh, I just got stage fright even trying to talk right. to a camera that could have been Taylor Swift right there. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I, I got to sing one more time. I, the song that was given to me was Breakaway by Kelly Clarkson. Okay. Which it feels kind of bittersweet. <laughs> feels a little bittersweet to be singing uh, the song of an artist that just didn't pick you to be on our team. Um, it's actually really funny. It was a sick joke, <laughs> a sick joke, honestly. Um, and I sang it. I felt very good about it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Kelly gave me some really good feedback, but I didn't win. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I look back on it, I know that my nerves definitely got the best of me. That makes sense. There were a lot of emotions going on in this little brain of mine. Yeah. Um, but I still have the utmost respect for Kelly yeah. and Blake. But Kelly, I really just adore her. And afterwards, you know, they sweep you off and mm. take care of business and send you home, what, the next day, maybe the day after that, and yeah. you're back to reality. So let me ask you this. If given the opportunity, would you go back? Oh, God. People ask me this all the time. Yeah. All of the time. Why don't you try again? <sighs> There's a part of me that says I don't want to do it again mm -hmm. because I want the voice to be an experience that I had, but also a blip in my career. Yeah. But who knows? Right. Who knows? I think I think that's a really, I mean, a, a wise place to be yeah. because, um, I mean, never say never, right? Yes. Um, but that thing you said about like, I want it to be a blip in my career. Um, and this idea that like, I'm shooting for higher things than just making it on this TV show. Yes. Like I, that, that definitely helped me get where I am, but like, I want to be, uh, Lauren Hall, I not be more the contestant than, of the voice, more than the girl from the voice. Mm -hmm. And people ask me this all the time. So, uh, using that experience, leveraging that experience mm -hmm. in my career now, People ask me, how has that helped? What are you doing now? Yeah. And I'm like, why aren't you famous yet? People look at me like, you're on The Voice? Oh, my God, why aren't you famous yet? And I'm like, oh, honey, you have no idea. <laughs> oh, but I, I gig now. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that more, obviously, later. And people ask me, like, I usually don't say that I was on The Voice until I usually play, like, three-hour gigs. I usually mm -hmm. don't say it until, like, hour two. Mm -hmm. If at all. Yeah. There's not really a humble way to say it. Right. There's not really a good way to slip it in there. Mm -hmm. Unless I'm singing a Kelly Clarkson song. Right. Um, but it's funny because, you know, you say it and people have been ignoring you for the last hour and a half. <laughs> and then the second you say it, tension's locked right on you. Yeah. So I kind of like to test the audience a little bit mm -hmm. and be mm -hmm. like, what kind of audience is this? Are they really appreciating the music or are they just listening to me because I was on a TV show? Mm -hmm. So it's always an interesting experience. I kind of experiment with it a little bit. Yeah. And I watch how other artists use it that I was on this show with, people that lead with it, people that never talk about it, people that act like it never happened. 
I would put it on a business card. Yeah, see, <laughs> see, <laughs> Lauren from the Voice. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. Like, do I use it as leverage, or do I use it as something as a stepping stone? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and it has certainly gotten me many gigs. Yeah. If someone, a- if you ask someone, reach out to them for a gig. Mm-hmm. And they ask you for your portfolio or your resume, and you said I was on The Voice, especially in the Midwest. They're like, okay, you're hired. I don't care what you say. (laughs) So it has definitely helped me secure lots of gigs Mm -hmm. just because of the status. Yeah. But I'm constantly trying to work past it Mm -hmm. so that people are not just seeing me as a gimmick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to ever become the girl that was always on The Voice or the yeah. reality show girl. You could get stuck in that little corner. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can, people will only see you as that. Mm-hmm. I do fear that if I do do that again. But again, never say never. Right. Well, and there's there's something sweet to be said about leaving on a high note. Yes. Like, I mean, obviously you didn't make it all the way through The Voice, but I feel like if you, if you went through that spot and then you tried again and it just didn't work, yeah, there'd be kind of this struggle to feel like I got to do it again now. I got to yeah. I got to climb higher than I did yes. before. Yes. and I think there's something sweet about saying like that was good then, and I will forever remember that. Yes, and you know what? Even I filmed that back in f- the summer slash fall of 2019, mm-hmm. and I am such a different person, a different artist, internally, mentally, mm-hmm. physically, yeah. experience-wise. Mm-hmm. It's crazy to look back. It, it, it's cool to have a TV show to look back on to see my growth as an artist, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But it, it's it was the catalyst and the validation that I needed to know that I could I could do it. Yeah. And so right after I got off the show, I hit the ground running because you have to capitalize on what you just did. People's mm-hmm. attention spans are short. Right. I upped my social media game mm-hmm. um, because I knew that I was going to be on it before it aired, obviously. Right. Um, and I played into it as long as I could. And after the show was done and I was off the show, I was gigging, gigging, gigging. Mm-hmm. And I was just all over California and I was a part-time server and I was a part-time musician. So my weekdays were cleaning people's tables and the weekends were singing for them at these wineries and breweries and all these fun things. Mm -hmm. And then you fast forward to March, 2020. Right. What happened? Can we not? What happened? (laughs) What happened there? I was actually away at a gig and there were talks about this COVID-19 business. Mm -hmm. And um, when quarantine hit, Mm -hmm. I put on my Instagram story, hey, guys, I'm going to be giving a live stream concert in two days. Okay. I was in California at this time. All right. So um, I rushed across the country in my car. Mm -hmm. And the day that I got back to Illinois... I hopped on my parents' piano and <laughs> gave a live stream concert. Very nice. You were probably then one of the first to like yes. jump on that bandwagon. I don't know how or why, but like it was the first thing I thought of and I did it immediately. Yeah. And I was already really, I studied social media marketing and I worked a lot in social media marketing. So it was kind of like second nature to me at this point. Yeah. And I had a lot of time in the car, so the brain was going. Mm-hmm. I was like, how can I keep people engaged? Right. So, you know, again, we thought it was going to be a few weeks. Right. Um, I ended up giving concerts every single day for three weeks, and I burned myself out yeah. very quickly. So think about seven days a week, one-hour concerts. Every single set was completely different. Mm-hmm. It was like a crash course in gigging. Right. Um. But I had to start spacing them out. Um, it was every few days, and it just kind of evolved into its own little thing. And I, I gained a pretty good little following from it. Yeah. Um, I'm really thankful for that time because it brought me a lot closer to my OG, and I hate to say fans, but like 
supporters and fans. Mm-hmm. Um, it connected me to them. I was able to have conversations with them. And uh, I was also highlighting other artists with yeah. my sh- with my show. We called it the Spicy Jalapeno Show. Uh-huh. Because my last fun. name's Hall. Right. Hall. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm tracking. I'm tracking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for a few months while I was home, um, I gave those concerts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went back to Los Angeles because we all thought it was going to end in like June or July Mm because we had that like, oh, it's subsiding. Right. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Within a month, uh, I realized it was not subsiding. Yeah. I had to cancel all of my gigs. Uh, The restaurant was closing. Mm -hmm. And I called my mom one day and I just said, I think I'm done here. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Lauren, I really want you to think about this. Like... I'm not going to buy a flight over there yeah. for you to not, for this not to be serious. And I said, no, mm-hmm. like, please come get me. Yeah. And at this point I was just very mentally exhausted, physically mm-hmm. exhausted. I was working my tail off Yeah. on all ends. And um, my mom took a one way flight and her and I drove back to Illinois with all of my things in my car. And um, I was back in Illinois and uh welcome back yeah not in the way that i wanted to yeah but you know what i'm really glad that i did Mm -hmm. um because it would have taken a long time for you to get me back here um i was really bummed for a few months bummed is an understatement but i'm just gonna say bummed Mm -hmm. (laughs) um because i thought that i had lost my dream and that i had failed and all of these things And I took a little break from music and uh, I needed that. My heart needed it. My body needed it. Um, I needed needed to really reevaluate what I wanted to do and what making it was and being successful really was for me. Yeah. So after a few months, I started um, kind of finding my my groove again and getting back on the piano and singing a little bit to myself. Um, And funny enough, I found my way back to a soccer field. Hmm. And that's really what got me back into my groove again. Yeah. That's this, cool. Cause it's like yeah. that, I don't know, that excites me. Cause I feel like there's there's this kind of process and this dream and this idea of this is what my future is supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. And you pursue it and it kind of works, but there's always kind of this sense and this point that like you have to figure out who you are. Yes. Yes. That's great. Sorry. Keep going. That's no, just, that's it, I, I pushed it away. I, I took a break for a very long time with soccer. Mm-hmm. And once I found myself back there, it was like everything clicked again. Yeah. It was like the, this part of me that I had spent so much time pushing to the side was a part of me, mm-hmm. no matter whether I liked it or not. Yeah. And once I got back on there... It brought me back to the piano and I started to find my balance again. And it really, truly, I found myself back in my own body again. Hmm. And so it is this weird full circle moment yeah. where the second I started playing, I started to really think about my future in Chicago. Yeah. So I got a job. I work for a credit union during the day. Heck yeah, you do. Yes, I do. And then um, I moved to the city. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm doing my own thing. I reached out to some venues, hoping that they would be open to it. And everybody was very open to me gigging. Yeah. Um, and I've just been working my way in mm-hmm. to these venues in the city as things start to open up. Yeah. And one show has led to another show and private shows and referrals. And mm-hmm. now... I moved into the city in March. It's yeah. what? It's almost June now. Yeah. I'm I'm booked months ahead now. Mm-hmm. And um, my music career here is really budding, which I'm really excited mm. about. And I just never thought was going to be a thing. Yeah. Um, but it is such a difference maker to be surrounded by your loved ones mm. in the pursuit of your dreams. Yeah. It's a tough, tough world out there to follow what you want to do, let alone follow a dream that is so big. Mm -hmm. And just being able to like go see my family on the weekends and have my family at shows 
it's just been unbelievable for like my mental health, my success as a musician. Yeah. It's it's all kind of coming together now. So mm. I, it all ha- happened in a very weird way that I never thought was possible. Right. But um, I'm in a really good place now. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're like out of time. But yeah. This is first of all, thank you for coming on the show. Of course. Like, thank you the, for having me. Oh, heck yeah. Yes. Yeah. This has been really cool. I just want to say like I've been to one of your gigs only. Yes. One, but um, like not like you need my affirmation, affirmation, but um, when we, when me and my friends got there and I just watched you like gigging in that space, like you really felt in your element and um, like, I don't know what the future has for you either, but um, that space, it was just like, this makes a lot of sense. And so, <laughs> I mean, you have my support. Thank you. I really yeah. appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And I'm really excited for you guys with the growth of everything you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like not, just the studio, but this podcast and the coffee you're going to make. You mm-hmm. know, the coffee is going to be so good. It's going to be so good. I'm just really excited for you. And it's it's nice to have a friend that is pursuing his passions just as much as I am. Yeah. So I'm glad we're connected. Yeah. You too, Ben. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's super encouraging out watching people follow their dreams. Yes. And there's other things that I wrote down that I'd love to talk about. And I mean, maybe there'll be, you know, a part two. Ooh. That would be qu- that'd be a lot of fun. A part uh, two. Yeah. But uh, but for now, we will have to call it quits. So thank you so much for your time. Of course. And uh, we'll, we'll be in contact. We'll yes. be talking. All right. Keep dreaming. Oh, I will. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.